Well, thank you very much and super excited to be here for what surely will be an exciting two-day conference. All of us here today share a passion. It's, it's passion not just for mobility, but a passion for changing the world. And I think all of us are the mindset that it's really delivering against the promise of new mobility will allow us to do just that. It will allow us to drive a far safer, cleaner world with the adoption of level four, level five autonomous technology, driving and elimination of pretty much all traffic uh, accidents, fatalities, at maturity, dramatically reducing emissions, providing equitable mobility access and reliability for all, helping those who have been living in areas that essentially have been left behind from the broader economic expansion of the last 50 years, providing greater accessibility and reliability and mobility for the disabled, for the increasing elderly population, and lastly, really serving as a tremendous engine for economic expansion, uh, driving a much more efficient movement of goods and people uh, to really unlock the value that exists. And we really have no choice but to get this right. Uh, some of these stats are pretty mind-boggling, but to think that there are folks you know, across the globe who might spend 2,000 hours of their year bogged in congestion. There might be folks in this room who spent 30 minutes trying to check in in the front lines. Congestion is a bad thing. We live congestion all the time. In the U.S. alone, it's estimated about $300 billion cost of congestion through lost productivity in 2017. Camille talked about it earlier today, but the increasing urbanization of society. Uh, by, more, by 2050, 70% of the population of the globe will live in major urban environments, more than 40 megacities, up from approximately uh, 15 today. And this next number is really the most striking. 1.35 million traffic fatalities uh, last year. The eighth leading cause of, uh, of, of death globally. I mean, that's just astounding to think that this day and age, more than a million people are losing their lives each year as a result of traffic accidents. And then of course, it's well understood around emissions. So we have to get this right. Um, the speaker before talked about his four children. I've got five children and I want a future in which they don't have to deal with this and we can do better and we must do better. So what can the future of mobility look like? In one word, awesome. Let's imagine a world in which we address this dramatic inefficiency that we have in mobility today where you think about private vehicle ownership, you know, at least in the US alone, a purchased car is sitting idle for 97% of the time. Now think about a world in which we can address that through shared mobility and shared mobility that is autonomous and electric, that again drives down the cost of transportation to the point where mobility right train options in the future are actual outright substitutes versus complements for private vehicle ownership today. A world in which we have dynamic routing, um, multimodal uh, connectivity to really drive the efficient flow of goods and services. I mean, this is a beautiful future on a very beautiful picture that we all want to strive for. The challenge is how do we actually make this picture a reality? So in our view, what's going to really drive this change, it's convergence of trends. Um, we talk a lot about sharing, we talk a lot about autonomous connectivity, electrification, and each of those trends in and of themselves will have an impact. I mean, we're already seeing it right now, you know, if you just look at the number of trips the ride-sharing companies are doing on an annual basis, you know, in the billions right now. Um, but we've seen also, though, that, you know, the reality is they're not really changing the game. I mean, today, ride-sharing as a percentage of overall miles traveled is still very, very, very low single digits. Uh, battery electric vehicles still, you know, 1%, you know, 1.2%. 1%. It's less than 1% in the U.S. But when we have the convergence of these trends, we really believe that we'll be able to unlock that step change in mobility. Uh, the autonomous technology will allow the ride-sharing companies to eliminate or reduce, uh, dramatically reduce their, their largest uh, operating cost, which is the driver today. Um, it'll in turn allow them to operate a vehicle upwards of 16 to 18 hours a day. And at those miles traveled, the economics will very quickly swing from a gas-powered engine to a battery electric. And so really it's the convergence of sharing, autonomous, and electrification that we believe will really drive the mobility revolution. And adoption is inevitable. And it's inevitable because the economics are so compelling. Uh, here's some results of the analysis that we did over the last couple of years, uh, working with a number of uh, vehicle manufacturers, suppliers, cities, new mobility companies, to look at the cost of a uh, world of shared autonomous electric vehicles. 
and how that would match up relative to offerings that exist today. And what you could see is that relative to a manually driven ride sharing vehicle, you could drive upwards of 70% reduction in the cost per mile. So again, while Uber and Lyft and Didi have all had tremendous success across the globe and are doing you know, billions of trips a year, the reality is, again, it's a still a relatively small portion of miles traveled. And that's because it's expensive. It's expensive enough that it's not, it can't be an outright substitute. And that's even with trip subsidies for both the drivers and for the riders. But again, this convergence of sharing autonomous electrification will dramatically reduce those costs and now make it affordable for most. And in parallel, the fleet economics have to work. Today, these companies enjoy essentially an asset light model um, that allows them to basically not have the assets on their book and take advantage of folks who own vehicles and want to monetize them in downtime. So to now say that we need you to invest at maturity, say $40,000, $45,000 for a shared autonomous electric vehicle, the economics have to be super compelling for the ride-sharing companies to move from their asset light model. And our analysis suggests that in very large cities and large cities, the economics are super compelling where there will be a very attractive payback for their investment. So again, it's not just the consumer economics that makes sense, but for the ride-sharing companies, they have an incentive long-term to go down this path. And I think most have already been clear that they see the future of ride-sharing being in shared autonomous electric vehicles. In total, across the globe, we believe this revolution will drive about 30 to 40% mobility on demand by 2030. And what's interesting, when you look at these cities here that we're highlighting, Boston, Berlin, Shanghai, each has a relatively different starting point in terms of the number of privately owned uh, miles versus mass transit versus ride train type options. But in each case going forward, when you project out to 2030, based on the economics for consumers, based on the economics for fleets, based on changing preferences of consumers, you see a dramatic adoption of mobility as a service, with the vast majority of that being autonomous vehicles. Um, you can see here in Boston, you know, we expect going from 7% mobility as a service today to upwards of 30% um, by the end of the next decade. Uh, Berlin today, very, very small portion of miles traveled are through ride sharing. Going forward, we think that will increase dramatically, again, with the vast majority of that being driven by autonomous vehicle technology. So against this backdrop, we're already starting to see a dramatic shift in uh, profits. And essentially, that's why all of, many of you are here today, is to try to grab a strong piece of this pie going forward. Um, if you look today, uh, you know, across the automotive industry, the mobility industry, we estimate there's about, just over about $225 billion in profit that are being shared across the various stakeholders uh, within the, uh, the mobility and the automotive industry. And you can see here that the largest concentration are in the legacy businesses today. You know, new car sales, you know, still driving about 80 billion of the overall profits. Uh, classic components, the tier one, tier two suppliers, just under 70. And then you see the aftermarket followed by financing. Going forward, the good news is we're actually gonna see um, profits continue to increase. So that's a good thing. We're in an industry that's thriving. And frankly, there's never been a more exciting time to be in automotive mobility given the disruption that's taken place. And we expect profits to continue to grow, uh, you know, about $380 billion by the end of the next decade. But what's most important on the page, though, is to see the shift in profits from the legacy vehicle manufacturers, suppliers, and aftermarket players to the new mobility players going forward. And of those, you can see mobility as a service driving the vast majority of the profits. And will you know, by the end of the next decade, be the largest profit pool, essentially taking the place of new car sales with around $80 billion in overall profits coming through on-demand mobility or mobility as a service. And we see here, classic car, uh, new vehicle sales will actually decline, uh, and autonomous and electric cars will actually pick up a portion of that. So pretty dramatic shift in profits that we're gonna see, and again, I think that's why we're all here today, is to try to get a piece of that action going forward. And not surprisingly, this is a very busy chart, so uh, I'll try to make sense of it in a second, but there is no shortage of private money that is pouring into mobility. Um, this is just a pretty picture that shows, from a quit analysis, the number of companies that are essentially competing in the automotive mobility space. 
And you can see here on the left-hand side, going back to the end of the last decade of 2008, there are about 500 companies in total that had some form of private investment in the autonomous mobility, excuse me, in the automotive mobility space. And a lot of it was, uh, you know, new leasing, financing type ventures, um, some telematics, but a relatively, you know, um, not, not a massive explosion of companies. Now contrast that fast forward 10 years, and you see here we are now in 2019, nearly 3,500 companies across the globe have some form of private investment. And you can see here the explosion, the types of companies on, on ride hailing, car sharing, autonomous technologies. Private investment is flowing into this industry because of the promise of new mobility and the hope that all the folks here and others, that they're going to be able to selectively pick the winners that will carve out that essential piece of part of the autonomous mobility as a service solution that will ensure that they're one of the winners going forward. And in total, um, it's about 70 billion, probably a little bit more than that, about 70 billion in total funds, that it, private investment, I should say, uh, that have flowed to new mobility since 2014, with the, uh, again, the vast majority of it being in ride hailing and sharing. So navigating this transition from legacy to new mobility is, is frankly one of the greatest challenges that our industry is grappling with. And the starting point matters. Basically, this is a simple two by two that shows, you know, forward price to earnings along with uh, forward revenue growth and allows us to see essentially where the market is basically placing their bets on who's going to drive the mobility revolution going forward. And you can see here that the market is essentially expecting, is essentially demanding and in many ways enabling the larger tech companies, Uber, Waymo, and I'd argue Tesla, to actually drive this mobility revolution going forward. They're being priced at such an exceptionally high multiple that allows them to use their valuable equity as currency in driving consolidation, um, making uh, smart acquisitions to carve out their position in the broader ecosystem to ensure that they are winners moving forward. And again, through that high valuation that the market is giving them, they're essentially making that a reality because it again allows them to use their equity as currency in driving the moves in the market. Now you contrast the, the, with the, the folks in the middle, the green players, the legacy vehicle manufacturers. There it's a much more difficult situation. For all the cash on their books that many of these companies have, for all the great technologies that a number of these companies have brought to market, it is very, very hard for them to break out from the pack and drive and kind of capture that winning position long term. And that's really the challenge that they're grappling with. How do you be the best at the way the game is played today while positioning yourself to be the best at the way the game is played tomorrow? That is the, 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 the primary question that each of the, the C-suite folks at these OEMs are grappling with. Be the best today while be the best tomorrow. And that requires how do you actually make bets that are big enough to matter? Again, you've got uh, vehicles to, to engineer, vehicles to design, vehicles produced to meet the needs of today. You have quarterly investors, investors that you need to please on a quarterly basis. How do you meet all those needs today while, well, again, meeting the needs of tomorrow? A very, very difficult thing for them to solve. And then with regards to the other 3,500 companies, uh, the startups, many of you here in the room, I mean, the reality is in that most of you won't be here 15 years from now in terms of the ecosystem. And I don't mean that to be, you know, uh, to, to kind of rain on the parade here today, but that's the fact, that's the reality. Uh, there's 3,500 companies essentially competing for five to seven slots across each of the mobility sectors going forward. That's the reality. Any industry structure, classic economic theory that you look at, there's approximately no more than five to seven companies that will be needed, whether it be ride sharing, whether it be the autonomous technology system, whether it be the platforms. There's not room for 50 companies to compete and thrive in a given sector. And so the challenge for all of you is how do you actually carve out that essential space that makes it be that you, the industry has no choice but to bring you along because you have that essential element that makes you critical towards the success of that various sector. But again, navigating this transition is incredibly difficult. So now let's shift gears and talk briefly about what if this offering of new mobility is actually too good. Uh, and it's already been talked about a little bit today, but let me spend a few more minutes on it. Let's start by looking at getting from the city airport. Uh, today, you have public transit is your lowest cost option uh, to basically make that two mile trip. Um, it will take 10 minutes walking, 
five minutes or so of wait time, and then another 10 minutes travel. Um, but if you're willing to walk, which unfortunately, at least a lot of us in the U.S. are, are not prone to do, we like to, you know, get driven everywhere. But if you're willing to walk, you actually have a very cost-effective trip. Um, you're looking at about $1.50 if you have the, uh, the Oyster off-peak card. Now, what happens, though, when you have new mobility that actually provides that same low-cost offering, but at a much greater convenience, again, if you're somewhat lazy and don't want to walk, but providing that door-to-door -door convenience at a comparable or lower trip time? What happens? And this is where we work closely with uh, the uh, City of Boston and the World Economic Forum based on some great data that we got from our partners, NRICS and, and UPS, where we created a pretty advanced uh, simulation where we modeled 2 million trips during the course of the day, um, about 10,000 commercial trips. And we understood based on forecasted changes to mobility choices going forward, adoption of autonomous vehicle, um, you know, sh shared autonomous electric vehicles, the adoption of uh, autonomous microbuses, what would be the actual impact on a city like Boston? Again, when we see the value proposition of a shared autonomous electric vehicle offering be so good relative to public transit. And what we saw here was really quite interesting. And then this was really the first time that we actually were, I think we were able to bring to life the very real challenges that are before us as an industry. Um, on a whole, the city of Boston, you actually see some pretty noticeable improvements. You see traffic volume is reduced. That's a great thing. We see a dramatic reduction in the number of parking spaces that are needed. Um, and you see a slight reduction in, in travel time. But if you notice here, the vehicle distance traveled actually increases quite a bit. And the reason why it increases quite a bit is because of empty miles, which some estimates expect, you know, estimate that around 30% of all miles of the ride hailing companies are empty miles. And when you have that, you have congestion. And this illustration of here at Boston from the study shows here the, how the impact will actually vary based on uh, the community. In the suburbs, we actually, I think, see the promise of new mobility come to life, where we see a dramatic reduction in privately owned vehicles, going from 42% of the miles traveled down to about 18%, which are offset by a sharing, which is what we want. We want to have greater utilization of vehicles. The sharing goes from 16% to 41%. However, if you contrast on the right-hand side, you see the risk of new mobility brought to life where Boston has a very well-established public transit network um, that it provides great economies of scale in moving large volumes of people. In this case, though, the promise of an autonomous vehicle and individuals optimizing around what's best for them. I don't want to walk to the train. I don't want to walk to the bus. I don't want to wait for the bus. I'm going to have the door-to-door -door convenience to get me from point A to point B, and I'm going to work. I'm going to talk to my wife, whatever it may be. That's the problem with new mobility. You can see here the actual increase of saves goes from 20 to 45%, but it's taken away from public transit. And you can see here time traveled actually increases by about 6%. And that's just, the, I think, the tip of the iceberg. It's really going to get much worse. We tested a range of levers on how to address this, and we see that there are a number of levers out there that actually move the needle, but not substantial enough to offset um, what we think are going to be some pretty inefficient flows in dense urban areas. Occupancy-based pricing, you saw this was just launched in New York following Stockholm and London. Um, you see uh, there's potential around converted street parking, and you see dedicated AV lanes. Each of these will move the needle. The real nirvana, though, is moving to really connected, seamless, intermodal mobility uh, with a common platform, where we actually have a seamless customer experience where we can provide transparency in terms of the full range of mobility options before you. It's single, um, one platform booking and payment. We can then use that data to drive better policy. You know, I think if you ask a number of cities, you're implementing congestion pricing, what are you hoping to accomplish? Well, we're... We want to address congestion. Well, how? How do you actually define success? If you actually have the data and you actually use the data in a smart way, you could actually drive real tangible solutions to the problems that are before you. And then the last, lastly, a more efficient mobility market where we can create accessibility and create transparency around the options that are before you. And the reality is this is not the first time we've dealt with uh, the, 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 the challenges of uh, transitioning to new mobility. This is a picture of my town, Chicago, where you could see here, you know, more than 100 years ago, buses, tro trolleys, I should say, horse-drawn carriages, vehicles, 
this is chaos. This is not defined success. This is not what we're striving for. But unless we properly manage it, this is what we could end up with. And if cities believe this is what's likely, it's going to dramatically curtail any advancement we're hoping to make in kind of driving that nirvana of that seamless multimodal mobility where we drive a much more efficient movement of goods and service, goods and people uh, through shared autonomous electric vehicles. And the realities, are, the realities of change are hard. Um, to drive that revolution to, the, the, the prime, the, to deliver and capture the promise of new mobility, um, the realities of change are difficult. We've got stakeholders that are vast. Um, we've got starting positions that are well entrenched. And of the, you know, the, the numerous stakeholders, you know, we, fr we frankly, interests often aren't aligned. But for us to avoid the picture that we saw of Chicago back at the turn of the last century, for us to deliver against the promises of new mobility, we have to come in together and, and in a level of private-public partnership um, and a collaboration that, frankly, is never, we've never before seen. And it requires us as a sector to really commit to multimodal, a common mobility platform. Yes, there are some players today that have carved out very strong dominant positions for which this will be a very difficult move to make because it will require them to make some concessions. But unless they're willing to make those concessions, you're not going to see the cities embrace new mobility to the extent that they should. We've got to create true win-win scenarios. You know, we have private companies that are hoping to make lots and lots of money in this space, and they deserve to make a very attractive return on their investments. And the, to do that, though, they will have to align with the cities and the various stakeholders on how do we actually drive some behavior change and incentives. How do we actually, whether it be congestion pricing, dynamic pricing, to actually drive better balance and network flows. We need to raise the game on public uh, transit options and supporting infrastructure. We have to jointly develop and implement smart regulation. Regulation is something that actually could drive substantial value, especially when we're talking about a technology as foreign as autonomous vehicles, but we need to be smart about how we do it. And lastly, we cannot forget about the workforce considerations. And if you want to get any city or any state or federal government to embrace new mobility, you have to be willing to bring solutions for how we deal with the millions and millions of folks who are in driving-based professions. But if we collaborate and we engage in a true private-public partnership, we can deliver against the promise of new mobility. So thank you very much for the time. Really do appreciate it. If you're interested, check out our Center for Mobility Innovation at BCG. And I look forward to chatting with many of you these next two days. Thank you.